All right, we have almost finished all of the lessons for the Old Testament that I'm going to go through with you. I can't hit everything, but I've tried to give you a good view of what uh, the Old Testament is like, the important, important parts, at least uh, what I think is worth teaching right now at the limited time. But today we're going to be going all over the Old Testament, <laughs> so I uh, hope you can find your way around. Um, we're going to start, these are called the minor prophets. The major prophets are the, I think, the long, the long books, <laughs> like Isaiah, which is 66 chapters long, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, uh, even Amos is, I mean, it, it's pretty big. But now we're going to be going over some of the smaller prophets. So um, they're also harder to find, you know, because they're not quite as thick of books. But uh, we're going to start with Ezra. Um, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job. So if you can find the book of Psalms, you can find the book of Job right before that. Um, so Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, go backwards. You can find Ezra. Ezra, they're talking about after, after exile. What happens then? Well, they have to go back home and rebuild the temple. That's one of their biggest things that they're going to do. So Ezra chapter 1. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, the Lord moved the heart of Cyrus, king of Persia, to make a proclamation throughout his realm and to put it in writing. This is what Cyrus, king of Persia, says. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has appointed me to build a temple for him at Jerusalem in Judah. Any one of his people among you may be his God, or may his God be with him. And let him go up to Jerusalem and Judah and build the temple of the Lord, the God of Israel, the God who is in Jerusalem. And the people of any place where survivors may now be living are to provide him with silver and gold, with goods and livestock, and with free will offerings for the temple of God in Jerusalem. So this is weird. Someone who's not an Israelite, someone who's not a follower of God, God speaks to him and says, I want you to build a temple for me. And he's like, okay. <laughs> right? So Cyrus, this king says, all the Israelites, go back and rebuild your temple. It's kind of, kind of cool. Chapter 3, this says that God can use lots of different kinds of people, right? Um, chapter 3, we're going to continue, if I can turn the pages of my book. Uh, chapter 3, starting at verse 1. When the seventh month came and the Israelites had settled in their towns, the people ascended as one man in Jerusalem. Then Jeshua, son of Z Jozadak, and his fellow priests and Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, and his associates began to build the altar of the God in Israel to sacrifice burnt offerings on it, in accordance with what is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. Despite their fear of the peoples around them, they built the altar on its foundation and sacrificed burnt offerings on it to the Lord, both the morning and the evening sacrifices. So this is why they're sacrificing to God. That's what we're doing. But they're a little nervous about what's going to happen. If people are going to let them do this. We're going to continue at chapter 3 of Ezra, verse 10. When the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests in their vestments and with trumpets and Levites, the son of Asaph, with cymbals, took their places to praise the Lord as prescribed by David, king of Israel. With praise and thanksgiving, they sang to the Lord, He is good, He is good. His love to Israel endures forever. And all the people gave a great shout of praise to the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the older priests and Levites and family heads who had seen the former temple wept aloud when they saw the foundation of this temple being laid, while many others shouted for joy. No one could distinguish the sh sound of the shouts of joy from the sound of weeping, because the people made so much noise, and the sound was heard far away. All right, we're going to continue at chapter 4. When the enemies of Judah and Benjamin heard that the exiles were building a temple for the Lord, the God of Israel, they came to Zerubbabel and to the heads of the families and said, Let us help you build, because, like you, we seek your God and have been sacrificing to him since the time of Eschardon, king of Assyria, who brought us here. But Zerubbabel, Jeshua, and the rest of the heads of the families of Israel answered, You have no part with us in building a temple to our God. We alone will build it for the Lord, the God of Israel, as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, commanded us. Then the peoples around them set out to discourage the people of Judah and make them afraid to go on building. They hired counselors to work against them and frustrate their plans during the entire reign of Cyrus, king of Persia, and down to the reign of Darius, king of Persia. So they're rebuilding the temple, and other people want to help. They say, nope, it's just us, and the other people get really angry about it. <laughs> All right, so we're going to continue at Ezra chapter 5. 
just the first verse says, Now Haggai, the prophet of Zechariah the prophet, no, the prophet and Zechariah the prophet, a descendant of Edo, prophesied to the Jews in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel who is over them. So God continues to send prof prophets. Prophets that we have books of in the Bible, right? Haggai and Zechariah. It's, uh, it's just kind of cool to see that you know God was sending these to, to support his people again. Because even though they were coming from exile, he's like, hey, you guys got to get in shape. We, you got to know what, what I want you to do. Um, so we're going to go to find that book of Haggai. Um, <laughs> so Zeke and Dan, Hosea and Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah and Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai. <laughs> and you find the book of Haggai? <laughs> it's a short one. I don't often go to the book of Haggai, but here I am. So Haggai. Uh, chapter 1. We're going to keep talking about this temple of the Lord. Chapter 1, verse 2. This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say the time has not yet come for the Lord's house to be built. Then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while this house remains a ruin? Now this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. You have planted much, but have harvested little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but are not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. Go up into the mountains and bring down timber and build the house, so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. You expected much, but see, it turned out to be a little. What you brought home, I blew away. Why? declares the Lord Almighty, because of my house, which remains a ruin, while each of you is busy with his own house. Therefore, because of you, the heavens have withheld their dew and the earth its crops. I called for a drought on the fields and the mountains, on the grain, the new wine, the oil, and whatever the ground produces, on men and cattle, and on the labor of your hands. Then Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, Joshua, son of Zohadzadak, the high priest, and the whole remnant of the people obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the message of the prophet Haggai, because the Lord their God had sent him, and the people feared the Lord. All right, so they're like, do we really want to rebuild the temple? And God's like, you know what? Yes, you do. You need to get out of your houses, and you need to rebuild my house. <laughs> I mean, if you remember way back when, God's like, I don't need a house. But then I guess he liked it <laughs> once he had it. No, he's like, this is what you guys need. It's not about God needing to be like, worshipped in a particular way in the temple. But he knows that they need the temple in order to worship him. I think that's really what it comes down to. God knows that they need to rebuild the temple in order to get their hearts right with him again. Um, and then we're going to continue reading Haggai chapter 2, starting at verse 6. Uh, this is what the Lord Almighty says. In a little while, I will once more shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. I will shake all nations, and the, and the desired of all nations will come. And I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord Almighty. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, declares the Lord Almighty. The glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house, says the Lord Almighty. And in this place, I will grant peace, declares the Lord Almighty. So it's just the temple, rebuilding the temple was a really big deal. Um, I'm going to also go to Zechariah. So it's right, sorry, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, I'm sorry, after Haggai. Zechariah chapter 1, starting at verse 8. I'm just going to hear all about how important this is. Think, I mean, you may not think it's a big deal, but there are multiple of these minor prophets talking about it, which tells us, hey, it must have been a big deal to God. <laughs> it must have been a big deal to the people, too. So Zechariah chapter 1, verse 8. During the night I had a vision, and there before me was a man riding a red horse. He was standing among the myrtle trees in a ravine. Behind him were red, brown, and white horses. I asked, What are these, my lord? The angel who was talking with me answered, I will show you what they are. Then the man standing among the myrtle trees explained, They are the ones the Lord has sent to go throughout the earth. And they reported the angel to the angel of the Lord who was standing among the myrtle trees, We have gone throughout the earth and found the whole world at rest and in peace. Then the angel of the Lord said, Lord Almighty, how long will you withhold mercy from Jerusalem and from the towns of Judah, which you have been angry with these seventy years? So the Lord spoke kind and comforting words to the angel who talked with me. Then the angel who was speaking to me said, Proclaim this word. This is what the Lord Almighty says. I am very jealous for Jerusalem and Zion, but I am very angry with the nations that feel secure. 
I was only a little angry, but they added to the calamity. Therefore, this is what the Lord says. I will return to Jerusalem with mercy, and there my house will be rebuilt, and the measuring line will be stretched out over Jerusalem, declares the Lord Almighty. Proclaim further, this is what the Lord Almighty says. My towns will again overflow with prosperity, and the Lord will comfort Zion and choose Jerusalem. So having the temple rebuilt for God was like a sign to the people that he was he was not angry anymore with them. He was angry at the other places that destroyed the temple and that took the Israelites to exile. They were in exile, you know, it says 70 years, right? That now his anger is burnt out. Like he's, he's had enough of that. And now the Israelites are going to go back to Jerusalem. And notice what's the name or the word they keep on referring to? It's Zion. That's another... It's like a term for Jerusalem, but it's it's sort of a bigger idea than just a city. It's like um, Zion, when it's usually talked about, is like this concept of a, a temple, not just on earth, but in heaven. Like when I hear the word Zion, it's like it's about it's a bigger idea. It's a spiritual idea of a homeland, of a home for the Jews. So we're going to continue and learn about Malachi. It's easier to find Malachi. It's the last book of the Old Testament. So if you can find Matthew, you have to just go backwards. Matthew's the first book of the New Testament, the Gospel. We're going to go and find out about Malachi. Once the temple was built, guess what happened? The Israelites did bad stuff, right? They, uh, they never, I mean, just like all of us, we all sinned. Well, so did the Israelites. So Malachi, once the temple was built, had to, like, get them in line. So Malachi chapter 1, starting at verse 6. A son honors his father, and a servant his master. If I am a father, where is the honor due me? If I am a master, where is the respect due me, says the Lord Almighty? It is you, O priests, who show contempt for my name. But you ask, how have we shown contempt for your name? You place defiled food on my altar. But you ask, how have we defiled you? By saying that the Lord's table is contemptible. When you bring blind animals for sacrifice, is that not wrong? When you sacrifice crippled or diseased animals, is that not wrong? Try offering them to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you? Says the Lord Almighty. Now implore God to be gracious to us. With such offerings from your hands, will he accept you? Says the Lord Almighty. Oh, that you, oh, that one of you would shut the temple doors so that you would not light useless fires on my altar. I am not pleased with you, says the Lord Almighty, and I will not, I will accept no offering from your hands. My name will be great among the nations, from the rising to the setting of the sun. In every place, incense and pure offerings will be brought to my name, because my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord Almighty. All right, so the priests, the people in charge of the temple, weren't doing the right thing. They were sacrificing, remember it said blind and crippled animals? Remember, if you remember... Uh, one of the important parts about a sacrifice was it was supposed to be an animal without blemish, with no problems, um, because it was like you were supposed to give your best to God. So I'll give you an example of how we still kind of screw this up from experience. <laughs> when, um, when we give our time to watch church, for instance, uh, and this goes, hopefully someday we'll be able to come back. To, I mean, we do. You can go back to church, but, you know, let's say you come to church and you're like falling asleep the whole time because you stayed up all night. Are you giving your best to God? Probably not. What if you're at home and when you're watching church online, you're also messing around on your phone? Are you giving your best to God? Probably not. I mean, God wants our best. He wanted the best animals to be sacrificed. He wants the best of us as well. That's the idea. So now you're going to go to Malachi chapter 3, starting at verse 8. Will a man rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how do we rob you? In tithes and offerings. You are under a curse, the whole nation of you, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have enough room for it. <laughs> Love this scripture. Um, God's like, when you, the tithe, the, you remember, know what a tithe is? It's 10% of your income. It would have been 10% of the harvest. Uh, so one-tenth. 
He's saying, you give that for the ministry of the, like nowadays, we give 10%. People say, is that gross or net income? It's like, I don't care. I don't think God, that's not what God's interested in. He wants you to take a tenth of what you have and give it to him for the sake of ministry. Um, does that mean you're saved if you do? No. Does that mean you're not saved if you don't? No. He's saying this is what we need to get used to. It's to say God gets the first fruits of our money, right? He gets right off the bat, we're giving him this money to, to spread the word of God, to help people through benevolences, to support our local churches. But he's saying if you don't, it's not that you're stealing from your church or the temple. God's saying you're stealing from me <laughs> because you don't trust me. That's really what it's about. The money is not that God needs our money. He doesn't need the money. He owns everything, right? Um, so what is the money about? It's really about our hearts. He says, test me. Now, this is interesting. God usually says, don't test me. But here he says, test me and see what's going to happen. You give the tithe and see if I don't overflow your life with blessings so you don't have enough room for it. I may have already told you the story, but when I lived in Connecticut with Christy, uh, we, we were, um, I was a pastor up there and we weren't tithing. I mean, we weren't giving 10% of our income. We, I mean, I was just a new pastor, okay? Uh, but I was like, you know, if I'm going to tell people in my church that they should be giving 10%, we'd better do it too. But we were like using credit cards. We didn't have enough money. But uh, we started this thing with uh, Dave Ramsey, the getting out of debt thing. And he's on the radio. Maybe you haven't heard of him. But in any case, he was like, you got to give 10%. So we're like, you know what? We're going to start giving 10% of our money. We're going to start budgeting. Uh, we're going to try to get out of debt as well. And it was so weird because before that, we never had enough money to go or to give to church. But now we decided we were going to give a tenth of everything we earned to the church. And um, if we didn't have enough money for the rest, we were just going to see what happened. But we always had enough money. Like we were giving now a lot more to the church than we ever had before. And now we had enough money that we could pay off our debts too. Like... To me, that is sort of an example of how this scripture works. Like, it is amazing. Pretty cool. All right, now we're going to find the book of J Joel. Um, if you can find the book of Hosea, and then Joel, and then Amos. So Joel. He was another of these minor prophets. Joel, chapter 1. The word of the Lord that came to Joel, son of Pethuel. Hear this, you elders. Listen, all who live in the land. Has anything like this ever happened in your days or in the days of your forefathers? Tell it to your children and let your children tell it to their children and their children to the next generation. What the locust swarm has left, the great locusts have eaten. What the great locusts have left, the young locusts have eaten. What the young locusts have left, other locusts have eaten. What's he talking about? Remember, these are farmers. Most of the people in the Old Testament are farmers. And the locust, what does the locust do? They're like this invasive species of insect that destroys crops. So it's like this huge swarm of locusts that are destroying the whole land. And Joel is saying, hey, this is, this is from God, okay? He is destroying our crops for a purpose, for a reason. So you guys better pay attention. Um... And then in chapter 2, I think he explains a little bit more about it. Chapter 2, verse 12. Even now, declares the Lord, return to me with your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your heart, which means rip. Rip your heart, not your gar garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love, and he relents from sending calamity. Who knows? He may turn and have pity and leave behind a blessing, grain offerings and drink offerings for the Lord your God. So Joel is saying, if you want this locust storm to stop, repent. Turn back to God. God wants your heart. Don't rip your clothes showing how sad you are. Rip your heart. Um, you know, return to God. Turn around from your sins. All right, so uh, now we're going to go to the book of Ezra again, chapter 7. Ezra is before Psalms. <laughs> Ezra, Ezra chapter 7. Gotta find it. Chapter 7, here we go. Ezra chapter 7, verse 6 is where we're going to start. 
This Ezra came up from Babylon. Remember, that's where they're in exile. He was a teacher and well-versed in the law of Moses, which the Lord, the God of Israel, had given. The king had granted him everything he asked, for the hand of the Lord, his God, was on him. Okay, so this is Ezra. Ezra chapter 9 now is where we're going to go next. After these things had been done, the leaders came to me and said, The people of Israel, including the priests and the Levites, have not kept themselves separate from the neighboring peoples with their detestable practices, like those of the Canaanites, Hittites, Perizzites, Jebusites, Ammonites, Moabites, Egyptians, and Amorites. They have taken some of their daughters as wives for themselves and their sons and have mingled the holy race with the people around them, and the leaders and officials have led the way in this unfaithfulness. When I heard this, I tore my tunic and cloak, pulled my hair from my head and beard, and sat down appalled. Then everyone who trembled at the words of the God of Israel gathered around me because of this unfaithfulness of the exiles. And I sat there appalled until the evening sacrifice. Now we're going to go to the book of Nehemiah. It's the very next book, chapter 8. Chapter 8, starting at verse 1. All the people assembled as one man in the square before the water gate. They told Ezra, the scribe, to bring out the book of the law of Moses. That's like the first five books of the Bible, um, which the Lord had commanded for Israel. So on the first day of the seventh month, Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, which was made up of men and women and all who were able to understand. He read it aloud from daybreak till noon, and he faced the square before the water gate in the presence of the men, women, and others who could understand. And all the people listened attentively to the book of the law. Ezra the scribe stood on a high wooden platform built for this occasion. Beside him on the right stood Medetiah, Shema, Aniah, Uriah, Hilkiah, and Maasiah, and I was left for Pedaiah, Mishael, Malkaijah, Hashum, Hashbadana, Zechariah, and Meshulam. Ezra opened the book. All the people could see him because he was standing above them, and as he opened it, the people all stood up. Ezra praised the Lord, the great God, and all the people lifted their hands and responded, Amen, Amen. Then they bowed down and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Ezra is like, hey, if we need to turn back to God, the way we're going to do it is by hearing God's word. I always wonder if this is where the idea that we stand for the gospel reading in church comes from, because they all stood at that point. Anyway, so they read the law. They were returning to God's word. They, it was like they'd forgotten how to follow God. So that's why he read all of that. Um, I'm going to have to skip the rest of this. Nehemiah is all about rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. So um, sort of to keep out people so that they didn't destroy them. If I have time, I can go back to that. Um, well, maybe we can. I think we have enough time. We'll go to Nehemiah chapter 2. Nehemiah. Sorry, I left Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 2. In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was brought for him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. I had not been sad in his presence before, so the king asked me, Why does your face look, face look so sad when you are not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. I was very much afraid, but I said to the king, May the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my fathers are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? The king said to me, What is it you want? Then I prayed to the God of heaven, and I answered the king. If it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah, where my fathers are buried, so that I can rebuild it. Then the king, with the queen sitting beside him, asked him, How long will your journey take, and when will you get back? It pleased the king to send me, so I set a time. I also said to him, If it pleases the king, may I have letters to the governors of Trans-Euphrates, so that they will provide me safe conduct until I arrive in Judah. And may I have a letter to Asaph, keeper of the king's forest, so he will give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel by the temple, and for the city wall, and for the residence I will occupy. And because the gracious hand of my God was upon me, the king granted my requests. So I gave, went to the governors of Trans-Euphrates and gave them the king's letters. The king also had also sent army officials and cavalry with me. When Sambalat and Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official heard about this, they were very much disturbed that someone had come to promote the welfare of the Israelites. I went to Jerusalem, and after staying there three days, I set out during the night with a few men. I had not told anyone what my God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. There were no mounts with me except the one I was riding on. By night I went out through the valley gate toward the jackal well and the dung gate, examining the walls of Jerusalem, which had been broken down, and its gates, which had been destroyed by fire. Then I moved on toward the fountain gate and the king's pool, but there was not enough room for my mount to get through, so I went up the valley by night, examining the wall. Finally, I turned back and re-entered through the valley gate. 
The officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing, because as yet I had said nothing to the Jews or the priests or nobles or officials or any others who would be doing the work. Then I said to them, You see the trouble we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins, and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem, and we will no longer be in disgrace. All right, so remember the temple was rebuilt, but the walls of Jerusalem, of the city, the city itself was still in ruins. So Nehemiah was really um, doing that, and God blessed that. Uh, and another, again, just like Cyrus, the king, Cyrus of Persia, had given them permission to uh, rebuild the temple, like now this other king, um, King Artaxerxes, was giving this Nehemiah permission to rebuild his hometown. It's just kind of, it's just kind of amazing, I guess. So we're going to go to Nehemiah chapter 10. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> chapter 10. <coughs> Sorry, guys. Uh, chapter 10, verse 28. I wish I didn't have to sneeze on the video. It's there forever. Um, oh, wow. Chapter 28. Nehemiah chapter 10, verse 28. The singers also were brought together from the region around Jerusalem, from the villages of the Netophatites, <laughs> from Beth Gilgal, and from the area of Geba and Asmaveth. For the singers had built villages for themselves around Jerusalem. When the priests and Levites had purified themselves ceremonially, they purified the people, the gates, and the wall. I had the leaders of Judah go up on top of the wall. I also assigned two large choirs to give thanks. One was to proceed on top of the wall to the right toward the dung gate. Hosh, I feel like this is not what I want to be reading. I am so sorry. <laughs> I am supposed to be at Nehemiah chapter 10. Ugh, sorry. Nehemiah chapter 10, verse 28. Sorry about that. I think we're actually just going to start at verse 30 because I wasted time. Verse 30. We promise not to give our daughters in marriage to the peoples around us or take their daughters for our sons. When the neighboring peoples bring merchandise or grain to sell on the Sabbath, we will not buy from them on the Sabbath or on any holy day. Every seventh year we will forgo working the land and will cancel all debts. We assume the responsibility for carrying out the commands to give a third of a shekel each year for the service of the house of our God. These are just three hallmarks of Judaism, okay? First, they don't intermarry with other people. A second, the Sabbath is always, uh, they, don't, they don't do business on the Sabbath, okay? And thirdly, um, they're, they're, they're tithing, right? They're giving to the house of God for, um, to continue that. So that was just something important. The final thing is to go to the book of Jonah. Sorry for wasting time there between my sneezing and um, <laughs> everything else. Um, Let's see, we got to go find the book of Jonah. Jonah and Micah. You know, I'm not sure if I have enough time to go through all of Jonah. But I'll at least read the beginning and the end. <laughs> Jonah chapter 1. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. If God calls you, you can't run away. <laughs> like, where are you going to go? <laughs> well, Jonah thought he could run away from God when God asked him to do something. Nineveh was a bad town. Um, God wanted them to repent. Uh, what happened was Jonah got swallowed by a, a big fish. We often call it a whale. Um, but it doesn't say it's whale, but it was a big fish. Um, and then Jonah repented, and, re and the fish spit him out on the shore. And now we're at Jonah chapter 3. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very important city. A visit required three days. On the first day, Jonah started into the city. He proclaimed, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overturned. The Ninevites believed God. They declared a fast, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When the news reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. 
Then he issued a proclamation in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let any man or beast, herd or flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may relent and with anger turn or compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he had compassion on them and did not bring about the destruction he had threatened. Again, it's showing that God doesn't punish people when they turn away from their sins. It's pretty awesome. So everything is great, right? God called Jonah. He ran away at first, but then God found him found a way for him to be a prophet to the Ninevites. They turn from their sins. All is good, right? Wrong. <laughs> um, chapter 4, verse 1. But Jonah was greatly displeased and became angry. He prayed to the Lord, O oh Lord, is this not what I said when I was still at home? This is why I was so quick to flee to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, O oh Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. <laughs> I want you to understand what's happening here. Jonah is like, I knew if I was going to preach to them that they were going to repent. They were going to turn back to you. And I know that you're such a loving God that you were just going to forgive them. It's like, so just, just kill me. It's like, I can't stand it. Jonah is, it's an interesting character. But I mean, you can relate, probably you've been around someone that's like, oh, why does, why do they, why does this person have to be so loving and forgiving? Like, why can't they just get mad like everybody else? Uh, but, but what happens is that God says, you know, what right do you have to be angry? So Jonah like pouts under a bush. And God sends a worm to destroy the bush. And Jonah is like, what? What happened to my bush? <laughs> and, and, and then God's like, hey, you know how you got upset about me killing that bush? Well, I would have been upset if I had to kill all the Ninevites. <laughs> you were angry about the bush. <laughs> Why aren't you angry about destroying an entire people? Anyway, that's, that's what it comes down to. So it just sh proves that God will forgive when we repent. And it also shows how silly... Jonah was. I love the book of Jonah. It's pretty short. Um, I encourage you to read the whole thing if you have time. Uh, but we are now done with the Old Testament. Yay! I mean, you can read. There's a lot more to read. But um, thank you for listening. Next time I you see me in a video, probably one of these videos at least, we'll be talking about Jesus and the Gospels. God bless you.